the largest institution on earth, has basically said yes to Bitcoin. It's going to get an asset allocation. The game's over. I mean, he's the largest asset manager in the world. Hello, everyone. Kevin O'Leary shares his investment strategy and his current outlook on the crypto and Bitcoin market. Subscribe now, hit that bell icon, and embark on an enriching journey toward financial success. Let's unlock the potential of these markets together and pave the way for a brighter financial future. Welcome aboard. Well, everybody's intrigued right now about crypto. They really are. We've kind of turned the corner from a, an asset class that was at war with the regulator to one that's generally accepted now. And, and as a result, I would say probably seven out of 10 questions I get are, what should I be doing with crypto, if anything? And where does it fit into my alternative asset class portfolio? Because we've always thought about, okay, I'm gonna buy some gold maybe, or I'm gonna do some private equity, or I'm gonna buy some real estate which are a little different than traditional stocks and bonds, which are far more liquid. But crypto's found its way into that, into the psyche of the average investor now. I, I, I would say it's more than half the questions I get and, and which crypto and how to hold it and, and all of that is definitely part of the narrative. I know you're not a fan of the ETF. I think last I read it, I saw you have 11% of your portfolio invested in crypto. You can let me know if that's changed, but what, what do you tell those people? It has changed. We just did our mark to market last week. Um, we're at 18% now. We're probably going to cross 20 soon. You know, you re you've got to remember, I also own positions in companies like Circle. I'm a big mm -hmm. guy on the picks, picks and shovels. I mean, I want to own... Think about this. If you could have gone back in time and somebody said to you, would you like to own a piece of the NASDAQ in its early days or the New York Stock Exchange and be an owner of the exchange? Where you're or agnostic. That, yes. It would you know, be a course you'd say yes because you're agnostic to the price of the assets that trade there. You get a fee every time they trade. And so for me, you know, when I start to think about digital payment systems, Outside of Tether, I really want to be USDC. But where do I get the leverage on USDC other than owning it? And I can stake it or lend it, which I do. But I want to own Circle, where, which is where USDC comes from. So I own a piece of Circle. So how do I mark to market the value of Circle? It's obviously, its IPO is delayed, it seemed perpetually. But now with the changing environment, um, and I have no inside knowledge of this, I'm just a shareholder, I think the, the opportunity for that platform to become a public platform is higher than it was just say six months ago. And so I've held it for years. And so it's, it's sort of, when I think about uh, M2, I own M2 through a company called Phoenix that trades on the ADX. That's a, to me, M2 is going to actually take out Binance one day. It's slowly bleeding assets over to it because unfortunately CZ's in jail and is a felon now. So a lot of institutions can't, use that platform. He's, he's one of the largest shareholders, if not the shareholder uh, of, of Binance. And obviously that lack of transparency is frowned upon now by regulators. There's so much, so much has changed since we last talked. All the crypto sure. cowboys are gone. And now I the know. regulators are in total control. And you have to think about that in the context of the global environment for owning this asset class. Curious if you look at any crypto adjacent stocks. I know you mentioned Circle. We have Coinbase, MicroStrategy, the Bitcoin mining stocks that are now starting to diversify into AI. Are you looking at any of those as part of your uh, portfolio or are you really kind of focused on what we've just talked about? And then, of course, Bitcoin and Ether. Well, that's a very intuitive question. And, and let, let's go to what's changed um, in Bitcoin mining. Now that we know with certainty that the ETF is here to stay, now that we know with certainty that large financial institutions want Bitcoin, let's just stay on Bitcoin for a sec before we go to ETH, just Bitcoin. Where is this going to be produced? Because it used to be if you went to a state like um, North Dakota, which has low cost of power or Oklahoma or West Virginia, they were against Bitcoin because it was at war with the regulator. That's changed now. So Oklahoma recently changed at the state level their taxes on Bitcoin mining, and now it's, it's pro-Bitcoin mining. So rather than invest in stocks of Bitcoin miners, I'm just doing my own mining. I'm, I'm 
going and buying power contracts. Um, I'm very fortunate to know some of the largest Bitcoin miners, so I can go into partnership with them and build facilities at 20, 30, 40, 50 megawatt um, for sites. Uh, BitZero is one of those I've got in Norway. So I, I'm, you know, I'm an investor in mining my own Bitcoin. And we, we hold those on the balance sheets of the companies that I'm a shareholder in. And that's the, the majority of my Bitcoin positions, which is why I don't need ETFs. But what a change in the last 12 months. I mean, I used to go to Capitol Hill and people say, we're never going to, in New York State, we're never going to mine Bitcoin. Well, Bitcoin is now mainstream. So why wouldn't you want to be a miner of it, particularly when you're storing hydroelectricity that's going over a waterfall and turning it into an asset that holds value in perpetuity? So, I, you know, I, there's a different argument. It was a very big negative green thing on it initially. That's going away now that there's solar, wind, hydro. Uh, and so I see Bitcoin mining almost like a real estate play. And um, we, we have right now three different projects within our shop that are in that 20 to 50 megawatt range. And those are significant investments. I have to ask you about the election here in the United States before I let you go. As we know, President Joe Biden said he's not going to be running for re-election. Trump has emerged this kind of as this pro-crypto candidate. Um, I would love to get your perspective on if you think that a new Democratic nominee could win over some of that crypto audience. And if you think a Trump presidency will be good for crypto. Well, we have heard from Trump already on crypto, and he is uh, pro digitization, uh, pro digital payment systems, pro crypto, pro Bitcoin. So we know that's in his policy. We don't yet know any policy yet from it's just been hours since uh, Kamala Harris has been. Uh, well, I don't know if it's firm yet. She doesn't have all the data. I mean, I'm, I'm a little surprised, to be honest with you, they didn't run a process after the Biden dropout because. Um, she doesn't actually have much of a track record on anything. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. We're going to have to wait and hear what she's got. But I remember in 2020, she was the first to uh, drop out of the, the race. She got no delegates. So she's never been tested. And I'm surprised the party just gave her um, this coronation, so to speak. I would have liked to have seen a process. But, you know, she's obviously an intelligent woman. So maybe she has to read the room a bit. And the, and, and the country has moved more to the middle. So we have to wait to hear her policy, including crypto policy. But I'm, for me, uh, as an investor in energy, I'm very interested to hear. I'm tired of, you know, I understand the, uh, the rhetoric between parties. And, if, you know, if you hate Trump, you hate Trump and you won't vote for him. But I'm more, I, I, don't, I don't really care about that. I care about the policy of each party. So I have the policies now on energy. I've got... Um, you know, a tax policy from Trump. We've got border policy. We don't have much foreign policy, but some inkling of it. We had a speech from Doug Bergen last week, which many people think he will be, by the way, a North Dakota guy, so pro-energy for energy secretary. That would be interesting. I have nothing yet from the uh, Democrats. So I'm looking forward to hearing that. I think it'll be a very competitive race now. Um, but it's really going to boil down to a policy. And we've, we've got to hear what, where the country wants to go. I think it wants to be in the center. I think it wants to be pro-crypto. It wants to be pro-digitization, pro-economy. I'm always an advocate for entrepreneurship. 62% of our jobs in America are created by companies between five and 500 employees. So I want to see a lot of support for them. Um, and then I will continue to do what I do. I mean, I'm kind of agnostic to politics. I don't make money with politics. I make money with policy. And I would suggest to everybody to think about that a little bit. In, in the end, don't get emotionally involved in politics. That, that's a fool's game because it changes all the time. If you stay, stay focused on policy, that's how you can actually become a good investor, a good manager, a good business owner. Um, and you can pers pursue the American dream. It's all on policy. Well, let me ask you this. I know you recently said that everyone in financial services knows that Jamie Dimon wants that Treasury Secretary position. I know you said that he would be fantastic at it. He has been outspoken against Bitcoin. What do you think that would mean for the crypto industry if Dimon took that position? Um, he's pragmatic on crypto. His own clients want it. He's not a fan. He's sort of in the Warren Buffett camp. I don't think you're going to change his mind on it. But he's also pragmatic if, if, his, if, if his customers... The institutions these services wanted, and they do. Larry Fink, the largest institution on earth, has basically said, 
yes to Bitcoin. It's going to get an asset allocation. The game's over. I mean, he's the largest asset manager in the world. And so I think Jamie Dimon understands that. Um, I am an advocate for him to be uh, somewhere involved in giving financial policy. I think it'd be very important to have that experience, that international experience. And so for either party, I mean, either for Trump or for the Democrats, he would be fantastic. I mean, I, I want the best for America. I want the best managers because I don't care who's in the White House. I care what the policy is. I want to see it well managed because I know who's ever there now is going to, could change in four years, but my investments won't. Thank you for watching the interview highlights of Kevin Olie Armani. If you enjoyed this highlight video, please kindly subscribe and help share this video for us to share more of this valuable content. Thank you.